And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Dr. Grace Kasorkoy, who was born and brought up in a fundamentalist doomsday cult. And today we're going to hear about her spiritually transformative experiences once she left. Grace, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff and Mara, for doing this amazing thing that you're doing on your channel. So thanks so much for having me. And I would like to first scaffold my story by giving a definition of the cult, and then I'll share some of its representative teachings. I think this will give us context for building up to how I left. And so as far as why I will uh, I classify it as a doomsday cult is uh, there was a doomsday um, basically a prediction by the founder who is an American evangelist called William Branham and he died in December 1965 which might seem weird given that we are still um, talking about the cult in this century and he was born at the beginning of the 20th century but um, his teachings were recorded and they've now spread internationally. And as far as the doomsday part of it, this was his teaching in the sense that he said that um, back at the beginning of his, um, his ministry in 1933, he said he saw visions and basically saw apocalyptic ending of the world. And basically he said that he saw the United States has become had become a rubble um, from, uh, kind of like an atomic bomb, basically. And um, he predicted that this would happen in 1978. And um, kind of the understanding of that mechanistically was because he said that the United States had refused to accept him as God's voice, like God's voice to the world, to us. And so God was mad about that. And um, especially LA, he said that because of Hollywood, it spreads a lot of fail and um, LA would sink under the ocean because of its, um, the, and he was also mad that LA would dare to call itself after the name of angels like Los Angeles. And so because of that, he said that it would be punished by being sunk under the sea and this whole apocalypse would happen. And so this was one of several visions he saw. And that's why it's a doomsday cult because under the umbrella of his teachings, um, there's a spectrum of what people believe with some being super extreme and some being a lot more level-headed, but this is this doomsday idea is common to all of the spe- like all of the umbrella within all the people within the cult. Now you're from Kenya yes. and the, here was this American guy over in Ke- Kenya <laughs> spreading his visions. How do you think he was able to convince people? Yeah, that's hilarious. That how, I love how you put it. Um, yes. Yeah, so the way it worked out is that there was a Kenyan um, gentleman, kind of like the forefather of spreading it to Africa, who visited the United States and came across his teachings. And he spoke Swahili, which is the common language in Kenya. And so um, my parents at that time were in college and so he started to spread it amongst college students and so it became very prolific all over and it was translated he, he spoke such good Swahili that he translated it into Swahili so he had like 1100 recorded teachings and by this time he was already dead because that was in the 80s and so he they became to kind of they started to spread it into different languages and that's how my parents while in college got into it and I was born into it. But the weird thing too is we had pictures of him and he's a white guy at home next to like our family pictures. So it made for a lot of awkward moments with my friends whenever they visited. Was there anything about his teachings that did have some value? Yes, for sure. Because there are things he taught that I still to date find useful. Like um, he told, he used to tell a lot of stories, like one of the stories he said was um, how Abraham Lincoln, I don't even know how true this is, but I, it, I think the, the intention is positive. Abraham Lincoln had um, pardoned somebody who was on the death row 
And uh, because he was so touched by this person who's going to be killed like moments soon, he just kind of quickly wrote a pardon on a, like a rough looking note. But the guy was already in his mind thinking, I'm a dead man walking. And so he refused a pardon. And then Branham taught this message called pardon. And he said that you have to accept your pardon, like basically free yourself mentally. And a lot of those teachings, especially in the early phase of his ministry, I think are still positive. And um, towards the end of his ministry is when things can, and in and out, like in between, there are things that he started to say that seem just like fear control. And um, people still say that he had a very successful faith healing ministry, that he'd play, pray for people and that they'd get better. But even that is kind of shrouded in some fear tactics that I can explain if you want me to. Sure, but before we go there, are you saying that African students took his information and brought it to Africa? And if they did, was their intent to use it maliciously to gain power uh, over people? I think they used they they had positive intent, and yes, they did bring it and um, spread it to Africa. But I think the intent was always positive because now there are churches that have sprouted up out of this. And, um, but I think that the idea was generally the way religion, just Christianity in itself came to Africa to begin with was people were taught to believe of a higher power outside of themselves and to discount their own beliefs. Because I did, once I got out, I did look into the history of how religion started in Africa. And I saw that even the first Kenyan president said that um, like a lot of the missionaries came to Kenya, like talking like lambs, like really nice and sweet. And then before we knew it, they were grabbing stuff and they would say things like, it's better to give than receive, but they were taking from us without even asking. And they were the ones taking and we were the ones giving. And then one of the things he also said was, um, then they became like prowling lions from like really nice sweet, line, uh, sweet lambs. And then one of the other things that I thought was profound that he said was, we were taught to pray with our eyes closed and um, we had the land in our hands at the time. And then when we opened our hands, we had the Bible in our hands, but we, the, missionaries held our land in their hands so over time we started to like just give away our power and I think we we were it was under the guise of kind of making civilizing the savage Africans so when you're taught to believe that your practices are beneath you know like what you believe is kind of savage so I think people seemed to have been more likely to ascribe good intent to him which I think there's a level of good intent that he had um, because I don't think you can do the amount of preaching he did and traveling without some positivity to it. But I think also the reason that it flourished is because maybe we were programmed and uh, by religion to just give our power away and like ignore our own divinity. So can you tell us how things started to change for you when you started to notice everything may not be as great as it appears to be? Yeah, so how that worked out for me was, um, I used to, so when I was a child, um, I started to have a few questions. And so for example, one of my earliest memories, and this was, like I mentioned a spectrum within the cult, some were more intense than others. When I was a child, we were in one of the more intense ones. And I remember we'd go to church and there were like four long services. And if somebody did something wrong, according to Branham's teachings, they would get excommunicated. So basically there was a whole process of how you get kicked out of the, of the church um, as somebody who has backslidden. And um, so I remember one of the earliest memories in church was somebody getting physically excommunicated. I think he'd been told he was unwelcome and he didn't, he probably was committed to kind of causing a scene because even as he was being, he was being physically carried, like they had arms under his armpits and carrying him out and he'd be holding onto the, the door bars. And as kids, I think I was five, 
we thought she was kind of entertaining because if you're sitting for four hours on a pew, that was super interesting. But then another person got excommunicated. And one of the things they say as somebody's getting excommunicated was that they'll pray a prayer and ask the devil to torture his flesh so that this person can go back kind of so that his soul can be saved. So they're asking the devil to touch this person who's being excommunicated so he can go back to the real world or the regular world? So how we, how they, I think there's a Bible verse that they would quote. So the idea is that because your, fle- your soul lives forever, but your flesh can be used to, so, to scare you into obedience to sort of, so then they say that they unleash the devil on this person um, I'm paraphrasing. So they want to kind of have the devil um, um, torture him, kind of like how Job was tortured by the devil with like so many terrible things happening. And then for him to kind of turn around and seek God and stop backsliding so that in the end, his soul doesn't go to hell. So it's just his body was tortured or his the things he loves was tortured. So you're saying they would say a prayer for the devil to basically torture them so they would return to God. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to say it in a way that doesn't caricaturize them because um now it does sound strange, but at the time I remember like when I, I did think it made sense for some reason. But yeah, like really that's what and there was a Bible verse that was quoted in a sense that um what 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 was that Bible verse? Like when um you've asked somebody to repent because they have they're sinning and they didn't repent, they didn't come back to the fold, then um there's a process you go to, and then you all go to church and you agree together and you say that this person isn't one of us, and then he's he's not under the protection of like God's people, like because when you're in God, you're like in the city of refuge, basically. And so now he's been, um, he's like over there left loose and he's vulnerable. And then at that point, once he can come back and repent and he'll be accepted back. So that's kind of the idea. If I remember the verse, I would say it's somewhere in the New Testament. (laughs) That's okay. Uh, So basically this cult was Christian based but yes. it had been manipulated into whatever it was. Exactly. Yeah. So, and uh, even a lot of Branham's teachings did kind of propagate this fear level. Um, as I can, maybe I can explain. Sure. Oh, I can, I can finish that initial story and then I can explain some of the fear-based tactic if you don't mind. Sure. So this guy who they prayed this prayer about, um, what happened is I remember that he had a kid who was our age mate and some other bad things happened. And one of the things that happened was he lost his kid, like his kid died. And I remember that he, he then came back to the church and I just remember looking at him and like noticing how, like feeling the palpable dejection he had and sorrow. And then also how he had to hit to eat like crow like humble pie and come back and say oh my gosh like you guys were right like the the god did unleash the devil on me and um, i want to come back and repent and then i think i just saw that people sort of owned that and i thought somebody just needs to give this guy a hug like i felt so sad that picture just didn't seem right to me even as a little kid because before everything was fun and games like the excommunication thing it was like physical comedy for us but now it seemed so real that somebody had actually been hurt and so yeah i think that's when i started kind of questioning and then some another fear tactic that had happened was um branham himself said that somebody had tried to expose him as a fraud in his healing ministry and he said that the guy, uh, but each year he would tell the story, he would tell it differently. So for example, in 1956 of December, he would tell this story and he said it happened by a, a man called, a man from Windsor. 
And this man from Windsor had come to expose him as a fraud. And that in, in 1956, so Branham told this story and he said that um, God kind of was mad about this guy questioning Branham and um, got him to like be bedridden. So he's, he would say, he told that the, at this time that this guy was bedridden from the sickness, like from being sick because God was mad at him. And then he would retell the story again. And uh, I remember like reading in 1958, he said that this guy had died six months later. But then again, he would tell the story like the next year he told the story and he said that, oh, the guy was basically still alive and he, but he got, um, he's still like in critical condition. So there's no way it didn't make sense. Like people would be scared to hear this, but once you compare them side by side, if he died, you said that he died a year later or six months later. And then the next time you retell it, he's still in critical condition. Then it's so obvious. It's not like he's misremembering. He's intentionally trying to cause fear and discourage people questioning him. And so this was one of the tactics that I started to notice. Yes, it's causing fear. And I did get fearful too, because as a kid, it's scary to see somebody actually die from backsliding. And I don't know, like at that time, you don't realize that, you know, as souls, you keep going. So yeah, that's kind of one of the biggest moments that I started to freak out about it. Were the people mistreated in any way besides you know, mentally. So, I, interesting, yeah. Um, besides mentally, I really felt like my, it was strange because I really felt like my childhood was magical because in that setting, you get very close together. As you can imagine, all of you believe this strange thing that kind of isolates you and we would be told we were the special ones, we are the bride of Christ. And um, we are like when doomsday happens, we would be raptured and everyone else, Branham used to say was atomic bomb fodder. Like, so we were special. And as long as we wore really nice long dresses. So in one way, I don't know that we were actually mistreated because in, especially in some of the more level-headed cult, like level that I ended up in later in life, um, people are actually pretty decent to each other. Unless you kind of backslide, then you get iced out. You don't actually get excommunicated in the more level-headed le level one. You just know that you're not in the in-group anymore. Like you can feel like the snow queen has come, basically. I noticed that you use the word backslide a lot. So yeah. can you kind of define backsliding? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, so backsliding took different definitions. So in the more intense ones, it could be as simple as owning a TV because Branham said you should not own a TV. And in fact, if he had a TV in his house, he would shoot it. He used to like hunt. And in some of the more, like the more level-headed ones, um, which this is kind of what happened to me, basically, according to them, I backslid, is if you marry someone who's of a different race or if you marry someone who's not in the cult, you're basically backslidden because that's against Branham's teachings. And Branham also taught, the reason that he was such a big deal is he is he was taught, people believe that he is a prophet of biblical proportion. So basically, Elijah himself, the prophet, has returned on earth and so even Branham, there's videos of him, like he did say to us that he was God's voice to us. So like how I have this microphone, God is speaking, like Branham is just the microphone and God is speaking through him. And even if you read the Bible, you're supposed to double check what Branham said about that part of the Bible because he's a prophet. He's basically the eagle with the perfect vision and the rest of us are mere mortals who... We don't have the, his level of like revelation. It appears to me that they were using methods to control the people. Yes. So control was very, basically really strong in the sense that, so the fear based, because I even remember 
he would he would tell stories um in church um i remember he would tell stories like if you if he's praying for the sick you better be very careful and be very reverent because he'd say that if he, a demon got out of one person it and you were just like not even bowing your head like being like reverent it could jump from one person to another and there was a bible verse for everything like for example for that there was a bible verse where jesus cast out legions of demons from a um, crazy like a mad person and the demons got into pigs and the pigs fell off a cliff so he'd be like you'd be like oh wow this bible kind of whatever he says he like box it up with the bible so like we better be careful and there's even somebody who including i remember even his wife he said that one time i think his wife talked back to him because he used to travel a lot and the holy spirit was grieved as he said it and his wife kind of developed a cancer um, I think it was an ovarian cancer, but Branham eventually prayed and he, she got better. So there was lots of stories that were like, you better not question. And if you question, then you're, there was, like, he, there was provision, like you're still thinking too intellectually. So because also it, was it wasn't encouraged to be intellectual, whether theological or like scientific. And if you're too intellectual, then just have a shelf if you have questions and put like this, your questions on this shelf, like not a real shelf, a virtual shelf. And um, over time, pray that God will give you revelation and things would make sense. But for me, there were there became just too many things on this shelf, like over and over. But at the same time, you better not like vocalize it. Were the people ever physically harmed? Physically? Mm, I wouldn't say in in like with I wouldn't say physically they were harmed um other than so some of the more intense ones would really talk about like you have to punish your kid like spare the rod spoil the child and I think for for some of the parents or some of the levels of punishment I think it was really like physical harm to the kids like it was just too harsh um, in that sense but I think some of the more level-headed ones it was I wouldn't say necessarily it was also a spectrum but I wouldn't say necessarily they were physically harmed as much as just like I think it's like the emotional abuse that now I see yeah of having that much fear so what were some of the first steps that you took to leave this cult yeah, so some of the first steps when I initially started to realize that I was kind of once, so I married somebody who wasn't within the cult and I also mar like they're also a different race. And some people, there are people who even came to me and told me I need to repent. And um, thankfully for me, I wasn't like actively excommunicated. Um, but I started to feel there's some teachings that Branham said, and I started to realize that, like, I started to kind of realize I was believing the teachings about being backslidden and being unworthy. And I was feeling separated from God from that sense, because after you're in the in group and you put on the out group and you don't really have much other places to belong, because of course you do have college and school and all of that, but this is the one place that people know the ins and outs of all the things they believe. And so once I started to do, to be isolated in that way, then I remember feeling so like separated from God. And then all of a sudden, one of the times that it happened was, um, I felt a voice in my head, kind of when I was thinking, um, Sorry, let me explain, like, let me give up some backup. What happened was, as a kid, when I was nine months old, um, I was um, I was thrown out of a moving car and miraculously survived. And then when I miraculously survived that, people started to tell me that as a baby, when you go to, when you die as a baby, that you go straight to heaven. And so when I felt separated from God after like having been like discovered, been like iced out, basically, I realized that I had had a chance 
as a baby to go straight to heaven. And then I also remembered a dream that I had, even when I was a child, once I started to question things, I, I had had a dream of um, now, it, I think it might be a past life. I'm not sure yet. I'm still researching. But this in this dream, I it was so vivid. I saw uh, like I saw Jesus crucifixion. And then people um, somehow I must have been like one of like the people who like was with was following Jesus. But I was maybe eight, like when I saw when I had this dream. And um people had asked me, like within this setup, people were like, hey, she's one of like I was a I knew I was a man in that scenario and they're like hey she's one of his people and I freaked out because I knew Jesus was getting tortured and he was getting crucified so I rejected like I was like I don't even know him and I ran away and lost those people in the crowds and then I thought after like once I was able to like collect myself I thought oh my god like I have basically rejected Jesus at his time of need and then but Jesus in that point, I saw a major, a big golden cross and I felt so loved and so accepted. And so coming back to being separated from God, when I had told an adult about that, they told me that I was coming up to be at an age, like um, to be like, what, 12 at that age, closer to, so I was eight, but they were telling me I was coming up to an age where then as a baby, you would go straight to heaven, even though babies are born sinful but they don't know right from wrong, but I was coming to an age where I knew right from wrong. And then I could I could make actions that would lead me to going to hell. And so as a child, I remember thinking, wow, I wished, I, I told this adult that when I, when I told them this story that um, I wished I had died as a baby because then I would have had 100% chance of going to heaven. But so as an adult, I remember thinking something similar, like, I have been rejected by God's own people. And it's not like I hadn't tried dating within the cults because it hadn't worked out for me in the sense that Branham's teachings say that women must like obey and be submissive, which if it's my choice, I understand that like, women can have, like some women take up different roles in the family. I would have been fine, but that meant for to some people that if I did, like if you did some of these people, that means abandoning your own intellectual pursuits. And at the time I wanted to pursue a PhD in genetics and I went on to a postdoc at Stanford and I would have had to kind of diminish that and support the guy's sort of interests. So, um, yeah, coming up to being um, like kicked out, it, not really actively kicked out, but it was just because people thought that given that I haven't obeyed everything Branham said, I wasn't doing the right thing. And I just felt like the right thing for me was so different. Like it's been so different. So it's like the algorithm gods, I think, sent me one of the people I respected, like a pastor who had left the cult and I didn't know. He had made this long video, like an hour and a half long video. And the video said like why he left the Branham cult. And he had discovered so many lies that Branham had told. And at first I couldn't believe it because I had been, I had thought that really Branham was a prophet because of all the things he told about himself. And in that sense, then, I went and double checked the lies he had talked about, like this pastor had talked about, and they were so thoroughly put together. So like, for example, Branham had said that the one way to tell that a preacher, like a, a prophet is speaking from, like is basically God's voice is that whatever they say in like that say the Lord, like if I say, I predict something um, and I say that God had told me that, and I say, I'm a prophet, and then it doesn't come to pass, then I'm a false prophet. So Branham had said that as a measure for a prophet for himself. And there's so many things he had said that really did not happen, even though like they tried to retrofit after the fact, but you can go and double check yourself. And um, in that sense, I double checked some of the things he'd said, like he'd told of um, a vision in which he said that 16 people would fall during the construction of the bridge, there's a bridge, the Ohio River, like, like something, but it, 
with such things, such construction projects, there's so much extensive records kept. And so you can just go look at the records and there are people who did a great job of going and double checking stuff like that. And not even, like really nobody had died. And if anybody had died, it wasn't relating to the construction at all. And uh, there are so many other things he'd said specific to his cult teachings. Uh, and some things were clearly plagiarized. Like he'd say, seven angels came to me, like according to revelations. And they told me to preach um, like the seven church ages and the seven seals. So these are like super intense, deep teachings, um, mysteries that he talked, he taught about. But then people double checked and found they were totally plagiarized from someone else. Like he said, angels came and gave him and told him to speak these particular teachings, but they were plagiarized like verbatim from other people. So I was like dumbfounded and mind blown when I discovered this. And I think for me, it was basically, it started out, I think because I was blown open, I realized anything, everything could be a lie. Like if Branham was a lie, because that's the measure we had been taught was like, God's voice, then what if even God himself is alive? But the thing with me was that did like that was for like a whole 10 seconds because I had had personal connections with God even in the cults. Like I would I would pray for things and like even before I knew what manifesting was, I knew how to manifest because I believed in like faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you don't see. For example, I believe I manifested getting a green card to the United States, like while in Kenya, or getting a program that I didn't have to accrue student debt, like that kind of stuff. Like I would pray and just believe and visualize, like even visualize seeing snow, like when I had never, like I lived on the equator at the time, like, and now I realize, oh, that's called manifestation. So I, I, I had had really strong connections with the divine just independently. And like with a dream that I had, for me, I had had the knowing before I talked to somebody about it, I had had the knowing that Jesus' love for me was irrevocable because even after I had walked away from him and des like denied that I knew him, he had kind of come back to me in this like big golden cross and I had felt his love like an embrace, like liquid love. And so even though I had discovered that and questioned everything, like I still couldn't completely remove myself from the fact that I still really trusted in Jesus and loved Jesus and believed him. But I felt like, no, I have to double check it. Like everything was now on the chopping block. Like Jesus is on the chopping block. God is on the chopping block. Angels, like, I don't know, everything, like everything I knew. And I remember saying, like, just praying, like if God, you exist, like the divine, you exist, please lead me to the truth. Like, I don't trust anybody. I need to know for myself and I don't trust anything. And I think this opened a portal for me because all of a sudden some crazy things started to happen. Like there was one time I was, I'm not gonna, okay. So I was watching a, a like online content creator that I love and I admire. I'm not gonna say who it is because they might freak out and something, crazy happened like all of a sudden I was looking through their eyes like they were describing something and they were in their own environment and whenever I watch like even whenever I watch your show I usually listen like I just have like headphones on and I'm going through like I'm a mom of two kids I'm busy so I'm, and I'm not gonna like sit and watch through like I watch the entire thing but I listen so I was listening and even though so I wasn't looking at whatever she was saying but I was relaxed enough that in my mind's eye, I started seeing whatever she was describing in a lot more detail. Like it's like we merged consciousness. And it was the most normal thing to me at that time, as much as I stayed relaxed. And then all of a sudden, like I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, what will this person think if they realize I am like in their space, literally like, looking at everything they're doing? And then as soon as I freaked out, I like felt like I was zapped back into my body. Like I was back into my myself. And so I think 
so in in Africa, there's this idea that when people are trying to capture a chicken, maybe to become stew or to find a nice, you know, a nice nest for this for the chicken to lay eggs and have babies, depending on which way that could go, that some people will put like delicious treats for the chicken until it gets into a particular place that like maybe a hut that it will get enclosed, and so I felt like things started being dropped in my path, like leading me to something, which I'm figuring out bit by bit. So I'll give you a few more ideas of things that have happened. And so whenever I thought something like that happened, then I looked up what that could be. And I started discovering like remote viewing. Like I had never heard of such a thing, like being in the car like for 30 some years, these concepts, I had no idea what they were. And then that's how I also found your, your channel because I started being curious about the afterlife. Like, does hell actually exist? And I remember thinking, if God values our soul so much, like, then why would he just, um, Branham used to teach that only one in a billion, like who are in the cults would make it to heaven. Everyone else was gonna be nuked and burn. And so I was like, if God values souls, then why does he just waste them and burn them up? Like, what that doesn't make sense to me and so I was like if something is valuable you at least reuse it recycle uh, and then I thought maybe God recycles souls I don't know and so all of a sudden I started having visitations from people who I didn't even know were dead like one of my undergrad best friends I didn't know had passed away but the way things had gone we weren't on the best terms the last time we spoke and during the visitation, we talked everything through. We were all still our normal selves. And I knew she was dead. And I've had even similar experiences like that. So I also discovered Dolores Cannon because um, the YouTube algorithm kept like bringing it, it up on my, on my feed. And um, no shade, but some of the thumbnails weren't the most inviting for me so I like I kept ignoring them because they didn't really have like I didn't think I would be interested in whatever that would be and then one day I was like I keep seeing this like you know how you can even say not interested don't recommend this channel because I didn't think there was anything in there I could be interested in it kept coming up so and then I watched a lot of the things she talked about and given that I have scientific training I decided to do um QHHT and then one of the sessions also somebody had a visitation as well, like from somebody that had passed away and they talked about everything. And I realized the afterlife is real. And so your videos also with like all the near death experiences, I started seeing even for myself that, wow, this stuff is real, including even um, like there's a time in one of my dreams, I started to feel like, um, my whole like I was coming out of my body and I didn't realize what that was so like I but I knew what I was doing so I was consciously doing this but I, like I don't know how to explain it in the sense that it's like you can your brain tells your hand to move and nobody had to like work that out for you mechanistically so it's not like I knew the terms before or what this was about but I would come out of my body and I would kind of, um, it's hard to explain it with words. Like I would be flying into different dimensions, which I don't know if they're dimensions. And I would talk to beings that look very different and it was not really speaking, but like telepathically. And then sometimes I would come back and I would be compelled to even draw them. I'm not very good at drawing right now. And we would have whole conversations. And I remember thinking like, oh, I wish I had a picture. Like I would like to like, actually bring back evidence. And I realized like I was, I knew I was out of my body and I was like, oh, why would I have put my phone? Like, I'm not really, you know, like, like I, I would be reasoning myself through this whole situation. And in some cases there would be, um, I've even met people who looked like, it first looks like this, like, butterfly golden butterfly and then they start to separate into many different butterflies and then they become people and they're people I know and they get the understanding that we all together decided to like have an like 
uh, an experience of traveling. So I discovered there's such a thing as astral travel, out of body encounters, and you can all like, people can decide to do this together and convene and, and, um, and I mean, I mean, it's been so wild discovering all the things that consciousness is possible, is possible for the consciousness. Um, I wrote a couple more here just so that it's because it's so much. I don't know if you have any questions so far, but. Do you feel that you were spiritually choked being in this cult? And then once you left, it's like everything opened up for you energetically? Yeah, I think it had to do also with, yeah, I love that, like how you put it spiritually choked. I think it's a fear because before this would have frightened me so much because even while in the cuts I had seen what people call shadow beings in my dream and had like paralysis dream paralysis and I remember praying oh god like protect me and I don't want to like I thought it was a devil like something was wrong or you know all that and then I kind of just shut it down and I think with my will I didn't want to experience it and then whenever people told me I had backslidden there's a teaching that Branham used to teach that the more you get backslidden, then you become numb to a point where you're just hell bound no matter what, because like the only way for you to go to heaven is you have to confess and repent. And for that means that you actually have to be convicted and feel guilty. And be because I didn't even feel guilty, people would say that I become numb and I was basically hell bound. And hell was one of my biggest fears next to death. Like basically I thought it was a train to hell like death was a train to hell if you want right and so once I realized I have already been cast to hell by people I really respect and you know people I really thought were right that that released the fear for me for like things that traverse the physical and then also I think because I had said that I want to know the truth like objectively I think and then we um also removing the fear as well, that now unchoked me, as you as you could say. Like now I'm, I think I got free from perceiving those things as being fearful. Can you give us tips for people that are either in a cult or who think they may be in one on how to get out? Yeah, oh, I, I do have... Yeah, I, I have a burden for this because yeah, it's 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 really sad now looking back and thinking I like when when you're in a cult and over time you start you really just give up your own divinity and your connection to God. And I think that's really hell on earth. And if you're in a cult and you feel like you're so scared to even think for yourself and you have all these questions. And if you already have fear of hell on the table for you, then you might as well just face it. Because, for example, when when they told me as I was a baby, when I was a baby, I would I had a hundred percent chance of going to heaven and zero percent chance of going to hell. Because even if babies are sinful, they come to the world speaking lies. God imputes righteousness on them, and they'll go to heaven. And then as you get older, then the chances, probability of going to hell increases. So as long as that probability is on the table for you and you're constantly living in fear, it's time to just scrutinize what you're being told. And if it's true, just know that truth can stand on its own. It doesn't need to be protected by like the church elders, by like just double check it for yourself, scrutinize it. Because we were even told not to check the people who like so uh, for example there's really great people you know in this cult who came out and have put together really great websites with information like john collins um he has a website there's believe the sign and and uh william branham dash org and we would be told that don't dare go there and check because like you'll catch the spirit of the devil and go to hell if somebody is telling you that maybe you should Double, like you should even double check because they don't have confidence in whatever they're saying being truth like standing on its own can you expand a little bit on how to get over the fear of leaving 
Hmm, yeah, I, interesting. Yeah, I let me break it down. How mechanistically? I think for me, what worked was writing. Like I journal a lot. I have like hundreds of journals, and I would write my thoughts. And sometimes I go back and look at my thoughts from like years back and I cringe because they were so fearful. And um, I would just write what I was feeling. So you need to get it out. And I for example, I would think, wow, like I must not be valuable at all if God just thinks, like he had the chance to take me as a baby and he couldn't be bothered. And now I'm numb, I'm not even... Like I'm blissfully, deliriously happy in my sin. I must be the devil. So um, I remember like I would write that and I was like, oh, so I guess this is it for me. Like I might as well enjoy my life as it is. But then if I would have some dark moments where I would be like, wow, like how, how was I so worthless to God of all things, of all people that here, here, this is who I am now. And I think, um, if one of the things that also helped me was Lorna Byrne, the angel lady, do you know her? Yes, I know of her. And I think I'm supposed to, I may have her as a guest. Oh, wow. She's incredible. Cause somehow when I would, I would write this stuff, I, I don't know, like, because I write on an iPad, like, I don't, I'm not sure what, what happens. Like the YouTube algorithm would be like, oh, sending me stuff that kind of challenges my thoughts. And like on a notebook, somehow, like if I took a picture just to kind of keep writing somewhere, like then I would see like Lona saying, oh, release fear, like a meditation to like free yourself from this. And then I would start to see, diff like sometimes even, I remember even I, I heard like, it wasn't a voice, but it was a different, when you're in such a deep, dark abyss of self-pity, like I had a different intonation of a voice telling me like, oh, get over yourself already. Like not, not really like, like a tough dad who's telling you, can you see yourself how I see you? Like somebody else was there telling me that they, they see me much more like get over your misery. Like you're not, in, you're not anything like that. You know, like I just felt like somebody frustratedly trying to grab me out of, it reminded me of that movie where there was like, I'm so terrible with movies. So if I tell my, my husband this, he, usually, he would know what it is. There was like a donkey and it was depressed and it was sinking. You mean like the animated movie Shrek? Is it Shrek? Yeah. And then the donkey couldn't snap out of his sadness and kept shrinking. I think that's Shrek. If it was like a cartoon. Oh, yes. That's the one then. Because I saw that scene and I remembered how I was feeling because I couldn't have pulled myself by my, their bootstraps because I was really, I thought... I, my, my, my days were numbered and then I would go to hell because like I would be nuked with everyone else. And so um, <laughs> I would see, and then I felt this voice that it was clearly because I was in such a bad place that the voice was such a different vib vibration from me, telling me that I was so worthy and so loved and so valuable. But I dismissed it like, what was that? Am I getting crazy? Like I'm hearing voices, like it was so clear in my head, like so loud, booming. And I think I started seeing like even synchronistic numbers, like repeating, lots of repeating numbers to the point where I am kind of a number, I like numbers. So like my problem is remembering people's phone numbers. Like I have to force myself to forget it. So like if I see too many repeating numbers, I notice something is weird. Like what am I supposed to do? So I would start looking up. And then over time, then, so like for the how is do the most natural thing to get it out. Because for me, um, of course, therapy is great for some people, but I did try it with like um, virtual therapy and nobody could really relate <laughs> because it's such a weird thing that like, I felt like I kind of I was going to the zoo and people were like, what? Like that happened to you? So like I was maybe the zoo animal. Like I, I didn't feel like anybody could relate, like even if I went to see a therapist. And that's why for one, get it out. 
and then trust that you're not alone because you'll start being shown your own customized messages and one of the things that also popped for me writing was automatic writing so you know when you're when you're writing and you're kind of like for me in that mo moment when I was like all in my feelings sad writing um crying and then I like I, I take a break and my hand just kind of goes limp and then all of a sudden something animates my hand and if you think of those um balloon things that people decorate things for Halloween like you know what I mean they decorate their their um, front yards for trick-or-treat yes and they like you blow it up and it takes becomes animated and then when you stop blowing it up it like completely goes limp so I felt like that like when my hand is limp and then all of a sudden something starts animating my hand and I write furiously like I start writing furiously and I don't know what's coming next like I don't even know my next thought after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you to either ask you questions or even ask you for help to leave a cult. Would you mm -hmm. be open to that? Yeah, I would, I would love to help somebody as much as I can, um, as much as I was helped, like paid forward. That's my whole purpose for doing this. So thank you. Yeah, I would be open to that. But I will ask that they be patient with me because I'm, I could be slow to respond. What's the best way to reach you? So I did write, oops, sorry. I wrote something here just because my name can be a bit hard to spell. Um, can you see? Yes, I can see it. And I will put this link in the video description. Okay, perfect. So that link tree is the best hub for everything that's happening with me. And then that email would be the easiest one to contact me. And Linktree has all of my other contact information. All right, great. Well, Grace, before we finish up, can you give us one last positive message? Um, if you don't mind, um, I have a message but in Swahili, but I'll translate it in English. It's from Psalms 23.6, and it's something that I tell myself, even when I'm doubting myself or I'm doubting, like when sometimes fears come back here and there and it's, it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life and I sh like, and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord. So it's, it's in first person, the actual verse shall follow me. So um, I can just like tell it in some form as like say, saying a prayer for people and a positive message. If you want to say it first in Swahili and then in English, that's, that's fine. Sure. Yeah. So. Mimi. Nitaka nyumba ni mwabwa hana siku zote za maisha yangu. So surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life and you will stay in God's presence all the days of your life. So don't let anybody separate you from your divinity because goodness and mercy is your birthright. Grace, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you having me on your podcast, on your esteemed podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.